Good, so nearly done. One more session tomorrow where you, you talk a bit about business. Today we talk a bit more about arts. And um, so I will present you, so it will be maybe the most lecture style I've done uh, this semester. Uh, so everything, no, there are little movies in between. But so I will basically show you most of the IoT projects I have been involved. Uh, and one project, IoT project I'm involved is by Houston. So he will kind of take over in between. And I hope you will enjoy that. Yeah, so today we will talk about various IoT projects. So of course, I don't just talk to you. You have to do a little work while I'm doing that. So I want you to judge for each project if this is a true IoT project or kind of just a side IoT project and missing some things and what it is missing to be uh, a true IoT project. Then I want you to highlight uh, two ideas today which might be relevant for your potential project scenario. So if you get some ideas of what I present and this can go into your scenario, just make some notes. Yeah, and then also try to, if you, if you kind of inspired and get some questions about ah, how, could, how could I do this specifically to map that on my project or um, if this inspires question in a technical manner, I hope you can write down this question. Maybe we can answer them at the end of this lecture or at the, the beginning of the next. Yeah, so if you get, so, I hope this is inspiring for you and that some of these ideas will trigger some technical or realization questions that come back to me either in the lecture tomorrow or in the labs today. So what will I show you? This is basically the whole agenda today. I will start with my history in the Internet of Things, and this has to do with home automation, so we will start at my PhD and with Legos. Then we will move on and uh, do go to IoT remotes. You can actually even see I have one here, so which I built myself. And uh, then talk about rainwater management by smart communities. So that was a project where I did in DC. Uh, we'll talk about virtual libraries. Is this something going on in the diplomatic service? Then uh, we will have our external lecturer here, Houston. Did I write your name correctly? Yeah, I think, think so, yeah. <laughs> and then comes the real artsy part. Uh, so lots of projects in the arts. Uh, I will show you the magic owl, which is kind of in its bare bones hanging here on the screen. We talk about performance and show support, so kind of theater plays and uh, music performances. Then we call, talk about the uh, artsy smart home called Ninio. Uh, then some, some uh, exhibitions uh, where I was part of in the Museo Nacional in uh, Brasilia. We will talk about bees. Uh, we will talk about LEDs and animations a little bit, what I showed you yesterday, but I show you some of the projects which have led to making me think that LEDs in IoT are really important. And then I want to kind of point you to a project at the Ars Electronica Center, uh, which we could actually replicate. So I think if you still don't have any ideas, I would say make sure you visit Ars Electronica Center again. There are actually some arts ideas for IoT projects in there too. So I always go in there and kind of think, hmm, can I do that, what I see in Ars Electronica Center? There are a couple of projects which I wanted to point you to. Good, that's how I, everything started. Or maybe it's actually started with this stuff and then it was my PhD. But this is my little uh, e-home demonstrator. It's the version two. The version one was built out of wood, but then my, uh, supervisor, my PhD supervisor thought I cannot take this big uh, two times one meter construction to any conferences and said, Uli, you have to find something smaller. And then I dug out my old Lego and built a uh, demonstrator I could put in my suitcase to present on conferences. And it has already a lot of devices in there. But at that time, we called that ubiquitous computing and actor sensor networks. I was a little younger, as you see, but uh, I was already at that time uh, able to excite a lot of people to work with little devices and uh, build integrated scenarios. So then they started calling that stuff uh, Internet of Things, and when uh, then all of my diplomatic life started and so on, and then I was working in a makerspace, and they said we need a show project for 
uh, one of the maker fairs and so we said okay let's build the next version of the eHomo demonstrator is what you see here now and I will show you a tiny bit what I did for that so where is my video folder So we have uh, one thing is a this is not a great demo quality. I what this was before I was a YouTuber, but um, wanted to show you kind of this combination of making and Internet of Things that you can kind of use weird devices in crafts to build actual actors you can use in your uh, yeah house or in your installations. So that's a small servo motor which controls a light switch and you can just put on top and uh, so that's basically a VEMOS connected to a servo motor connected to a light switch and so the only thing we needed were a couple of screws and two plates done with a laser cutter and with this we could actually do something to set on a normal switch and yeah control that switch remotely so it's pretty there is some combination in kind of product development uh, in the IoT where you can use the skills you are also exploring here so then I wanted to show you a second part I did on the eHome demonstrator showing the some of the features I can present on this eHome demonstrator Okay, as promised here, a little quick teaser for some new features of the Home Demonstrator version 3. So I will just start as I usually start. So we enter the house. So I take the phone and open it there. Then it starts the unlock function. Switches on directly the light. Welcome back home at the Home Demonstrator version 3. The current time is 23.10. I measure this was the door closing. Fahrenheit in the living room. So Have a wonderful time and <laughs> enjoy yourself. So it now actually welcomes you when you come home. So let's exit this. Switch this off. And let's assume you want to switch this one on again. And now let's assume you want to go to the living room and enjoy some music and you say turn music mode on okay get comfortable and relax while listening to the music it switches off the light and starts music to listen to Stop it again. You can tell us the time. The current time is 2311. You can say us the temperature. It is currently 62 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Expected precipitation is one millimeter. And we can end this. Goodbye. Have a great day. I hope you enjoyed the tour. Okay, I think some of you have played with that in Node Red already, so I think most of that you can already do, what you have seen there. But you saw also the little switch in action uh, I had there. So yeah, home automation is definitely one of the domains you can use for the Internet of Things. So as I promised, talk a little bit of remotes. So when I, actually even before I built the eHome Demonstrator version 3, um, I gave some classes in uh, Indonesia and Singapore on building your own uh, gaming controllers. So that uh, was in collaboration with uh, William Hu, the guy who designed the Espresso. And you can actually, yeah, you can a little bit see there is one of the Espressos, the Espresso light kind of in this uh, case. And we used in that case to build an old retro style joystick. And you might have seen that I developed a mobile computer game and we were able to control the mobile computer Pac-Man style game. And we were able to control that game with these game controllers. Oh yeah, that's over there. But so the same technology I use for that 
is at work here for going forward and backward with the uh, 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 slides. So I wanted to show you a tiny bit how that is done. So let's open Node Red. So, and this is the remote. So you see I have a left, right, and lower. And uh, the, you know the is press stuff here as usual. And the interesting stuff here is I use this execute node and which allows me to inject a fake key into my desktop. Yeah, so both for, for all operating systems, you find things you can via command line play back a key uh, on the OS. And so this is basically just calling here a script. Is it? Yeah. Actually, I haven't even looked in that script. Let's see. Yeah. Where is that? Rich inject. No, it's here. So I will show you my script. It's amazing. See, it's basically one line. It just says xdo tool key. And you find something similar for Windows or Mac 2 if you want to build something like that uh, on there. There are also Python libraries, so you can build your own script. But so you should be able. And you see, it's really it's just a key. So if I, if I now press here, uh, see the cursor is just w walking through there. And I can make spaces, too, with the third key. But you can basically generate anything. Uh, you want that. People always like this demo quite a bit because, and it's really nice. You just need a button, a BIMOS, and a battery, and uh, then you and run, run Node Red on your computer and have some kind of the same Wi Fi, and then you can build uh, your own PowerPoint clicker. So let's go on. And you can imagine, you can do that for old retro style games too. So you can kind of do left, right, up, down, and uh, fire. And then, or you might even have a game you can play with multiple persons on one keyboard. And then you can play even that. You can build several uh, of these controllers. And then you can, yeah, have a retro style gaming session, session uh, with that. So uh, the idea here was actually to use the game controllers in cafes. So there in, 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 in Asia, it's retro style computer games have a huge comeback and a lot of cafes where you can play kind of Pac-Man, Bomberman, kind of these old style uh, computer games. And yeah, I think if I would have stayed longer, I would have maybe started building some more professional uh, game installation based on that technology. We were thinking of using wine barrels and putting a screen beneath and a glass plate on top and then having the controllers to give out, uh, being able while you drink your beer to do some kind of old school gaming uh, with or against each other. That was a demonstration. Ah, hmm, this is the point where I need some water. Hmm. Does anybody have a bit of water you can share with me? <laughs> no, I don't know. No. Uh, because we also, uh, Houston, or would you can run quickly to the bathroom and get me some water? Ah, or maybe take some water from. <laughs> I just really need a, a bit. I need to be able to present the the. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> awesome. So in Baltimore, actually also in Rio, there is a rain problem. And uh, there's not, a, also a, not only a rain problem, but also a problem with uh, disadvantaged communities doing a lot of violent things, a lot of crime. And so it was part of an initiative to look for solutions how to get disadvantaged groups off the street and still do something useful what helps the city. So we wanted to create a project that allows people to build something which is useful for the city uh, in a very short time and maybe get inspired to build more of these. Uh, so it had to be really cheap. You know, a lot of our stuff I do has to do with lowering the price. 
And so we came up with this idea to build this rainwater sensor you could install in the canalization and then uh, have a gateway which collects the uh, data if water is in which channels. Problem in Baltimore was if the water comes out at the wrong point, uh, this, the town has to pay huge, huge fees uh, for this. And I think the problem in Rio, for example, is if the water comes down at the wrong point, kind of whole cities go down <laughs> into the sea. And so kind of being able to react quicker uh, would be very, very beneficial for the town. And if you even could inspire people to learn and not uh, do so much criminality, uh, maybe help locally their people or maybe help the city, would actually be a win-win situation for both sides. Yeah, and uh, the, this one uh, here, I have uh, rebuilt that very quickly. <laughs> uh, let's go into the node red GUI. Node red GUI. Let's reload that for making sure that it survives my power thing. So I haven't tested that today. Maybe it doesn't work now. So we put it in the water and it doesn't work. Ah, great. So we have to debug it first. Whoa. Why does the demo not work? It's the demo effect, I assume. Even the device actually didn't. Ah, when you see that thing blinks, it has a local function. So it actually starts blinking when you make it wet. Yeah, now it stops. So if I put it back into the water, uh, it starts blinking. Uh, there's still water here on the, uh, on the center. And I made it quite uh, sensitive. But so it should actually here show a notification and also play a sound, which is a little bit what I wanted to show because you want to do that at home. Why don't I make sure and restart no red maybe there's something there let's see is this actually something coming ah Are you? It's still showing it's wet. Ah, and now see it actually fires. So let's put some water on, and should the water sensor starter should go from dry. but it doesn't go from dry to wet. Probably need to re reload that too. Now, ah, so you see it just flips very, very quickly. So let's kind of, I might have been a little, yeah, now it's wet. But I have a, a delay timer in there, so it doesn't fire all the time, the sound. Uh, so I don't, good, kind of works. Let's show you what's going on there. And uh, so first I show you the node red. So this is the water sensor. And so we get the input here on the analog sensor and uh, based on uh, what it sends out, then it has this limit here. But the interesting thing is you see it goes both to the show notification and it goes to constructing this uh, uh, file name, which then it reads from the disk and plays as the audio out. So if you want to do the thunder for the animation, you need exactly the same construction uh, as I did here. And you see the status is actually also here on a button. So how does this program work? There's something interesting there I wanted to show you. Mm -hmm.
the examples are also all online in the examples. IoT temp configs test system. Did this kind of animate at one point in between here now? Have you seen some kind of flashing of the LEDs? Yeah, good. So that, that means that should actually work. <laughs> Yeah, it should be random, so. <laughs> so let's see where my water sensor is, here. So when you see the default stuff, it has an analog port and the output, but there's something that's local blinking here, yeah? And that you haven't experienced yet. So what, uh, there's no real, um, there's no real uh, loop in uh, IoT Empower. It's kind of all de declarative. And you see here basically when I start, uh, when I read wet, I also start a function. So there's a scheduler. This is called do later. Uh, and do, this here means in 100 milliseconds start with the ID the blink function. Yeah, and see here's the blink function. The blink function uh, toggles the blue LED, and then for uh, a specific, and it also sets the number of blinks. And so, uh, if it's a little bit like with the f uh, frames we have, so each time uh, it calls itself, then you have a recurs basic kind of recursive call here where it calls itself, and then the blink numbers go down. And with this, I can blink ten times when I measure the water. Yeah, but still kind of keep all the other multitasking here uh, in place. So I wanted to show that. So this do later stuff can be coming in handy if you want to do something locally like blinking on the device. Yeah, let's go back and I think that might be time for... Ah, there's one more thing before I think we go to Houston. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In the, you know that I'm kind of in all the, uh, kind of uh, all around the world, and so I kind of come to some conferences where I discuss with people who do the development work, and um, there are a lot of areas where there's no internet in the world still, and kind of villages that don't have any internet, and um, especially in public diplomacy, it's a lot about giving people access to literature, to something to read, and uh, Wikipedia, and these kind of things. And as you have seen, we can use the Raspberry Pi as a router, and we can actually put content on the Raspberry Pi on the, uh, on the SD card. So one of the colleagues of my wife is actually bringing Raspberry Pis to these type of villages and then uh, provide the material uh, the American government seems to be fit to help communities on these devices. We are using, uh, in the moment, we are using the so-called Pirate Box for this. Uh, it also allows you to chat with people on there, but we are considering to merge Pirate Box with IoT Empower, so to also do some infrastructure, give a gateway for doing infrastructure stuff. So let me find Houston's PhD. This is yours, Houston, yeah? And now see how, I think I could do full screen here. Not, not as great as I thought. Presented slideshow. Do you want to use my uh, fancy remote? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for this um, opportunity. And I uh, promise to be very quick, just two or three hours. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a very, very short presentation. Uh, I would like to talk about what I'm trying to do here in Austria, why I uh, fly to the other <laughs> side of the world to do what I'm doing, okay? Um, those guys, uh, Professor Marcos is my main advisor from Brazil. Uh, 
Professor Nordsra. Nordsra. I have problems with the language, of course. <laughs> I'm trying to improve. It's a professor of me. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> and uh, Professor Jeremiah, Jake, is my local advisor. Okay. I will talk about this. This thing. Jeremiah works in MTD, so it's the other uh, program here. And uh, the context, the problems I'm trying to face, uh, my approach to those uh, problems, uh, the scenario, and of course, what I'm doing right now, okay? It's a very high level introduction. So I don't know if you know something about Brazil more than football, <laughs> more than music, but uh, we have a... Um, a huge problem, not only in Brazil. So I bring some uh, statistics to show a little bit about the context I'm trying to work with, okay? Uh, in Brazil, we have uh, a very um, uh, expressive number of people dying because of violence. It's a very uh, problematic country. Uh, I live in Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo uh, is not as bad as other cities, uh, as you can see. We have uh, Natal and Fortaleza. Both cities are on northeast of Brazil, not in south of Brazil. And Rio de Janeiro is not there. It's, this is weird mm -hmm. because everybody knows Rio because of it's a beautiful city, but have a lot of problems, social problems. And uh, what I'm trying to work with. Everybody agrees that uh, police is uh, quite necessary on this kinds of scenarios to keep the peace and help people. Uh, police is not a bad idea. The problem is the police in Brazil is a little bit violent sometimes. They react very bad in certain situations. So as a scientist, uh, as a researcher, I try to solve real problems and I start thinking about this idea how to make better cops, how to help uh, cops to improve. So uh, I start reading a lot of things about how police uh, do the training. And I, I ask my friends, relatives, ask people and talk with thousands of persons and they explain me uh, something like this. This is the scenario. So they have to train and they train a lot, actually. Uh, the problem is the police training is very, very limited. Uh, to form a regular cop, they need about one year. Uh, the low level cop, the most common cop, okay? <laughs> At least one year of academy training. So this training is very expensive. Okay, we don't have a problem because Brazil is not a poor country. This is something very important. We are a rich country with a lot of poor people. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, uh, Sao Paulo, this is a police, uh, Sao Paulo police, Sao Paulo is a, a huge state, it's a very rich city, one of the richest city on uh, South America, and they face problems. They have problems to train cops, to invest more money uh, in training cops. So how to train better cops? Uh, when we do science, when we do research, sometimes we have to think like kids. Yeah, it's a very naive uh, assumption, like this better. Is yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes uh, better training can provide better cops. It's a very naive supposition, right? It's okay. The problem is how to improve the training if training is very expensive. Okay. Uh, so, I have two problems here. Let me go back a little bit. <laughs> Can you see that guy? The guy from left? The guy from left probably is the supervisor. He's the most experienced cop because he's not using a vest. He's not porting a gun. He's just looking uh, what the guys are doing. And the other two guys, of course, are the professionals. The guys doing the training. What's the problem here? No idea? No, there's nothing wrong. <laughs> uh, at the beginning, there's nothing wrong. The problem is this guy from left is judging the other guys. 
based on his experience, on his opinion, what is good, what is bad. This is a very important thing to keep in mind, okay? Uh, because this is the second problem. The first problem, as I told you, uh, is the price, is the costs uh, and the difficult of uh, doing different scenarios. Uh, these are the two problems, okay? Police training is very expensive, time-consuming and very limited because you can't do a lot of different scenarios. Second problem, the evaluation of police officers uh, is uh, generally <laughs> made for uh, by other cops. Uh, this is a, a bias problem. Bias is not a problem. No. Not always a problem, but sometimes could be a problem because it's a very subjective evaluation how to improve the training uh, at the same time reducing the cost and doing a better training based on real data so that's why i came up with this idea using <laughs> virtual reality and iot this uh, again i'm trying to prove this idea could solve the problem of course i have I have a lot of problems <laughs> to solve the problem. <laughs> this is the base of any research. You, you sometimes have an idea to solve a problem, but you have to prove this idea works. This idea is very consistent. So uh, to uh, deal with the first problem, uh, police training is very expensive, time consuming uh, and uh, limited in scenarios. Okay, we can do uh, something using virtual reality. It's very flexible, it's very affordable, because uh, right now the virtual reality te uh, technology and the, the, the devices are, uh, uh, the, the prices are uh, uh, getting lower every time, and the quality is getting higher. They are targeting uh, the Oculus Quest yeah. uh, at the moment, which is kind of available for 400 a piece. Exactly. Even even uh, uh, in my country, in this country. kind of things it, it's it's very very affordable. Okay, uh, already they already know virtual reality, and some countries like United States they use uh, virtual reality systems to train cops. Yes, but those systems cost thousands, mm -hmm. thousands of dollars. Imagine a country like. Uh, a poor country. I, I show you a lot of countries here. Uh, imagine a country who needs this kind of thing, but that doesn't have thousands of dollars. And if they have thousands of dollars, probably the biggest cities uh, will receive the training, <laughs> not the smallest cities. And you know, the, the, this, this is a very, very complicated issue. So uh, the second problem, IoT, uh, the evaluation of officers is uh, subjective. Uh, if we use real data, capture data from people during the training, uh, we probably have a more reliable way to see if these cops are stressed or if they have real problems to deal with stressful situations. So that's why I'm doing this whole thing uh, and trying to prove this, this solution works. Actually, my research, my research gap, the thing I'm really trying to do is on the middle of these three things. Okay, uh, virtual reality, IoT, and serious games. Serious games because uh, everybody knows uh, games. You know games. Everybody play games here. Uh, but serious games is a little bit different from uh, the games you know. Serious games are. They have the same purpose. They uh, take you out from the reality. They isolate you from the reality, but at the same time. They don't have the same purpose of playing God of War. It, it's a, a little bit different. The idea is to teach you something, is to put you on a situation uh, that you have to solve problems and you learn something with that. Okay, you can learn something playing Assassin's Creed. Of course you can. But uh, Assassin's Creed is not made uh, for teach people. Okay, you can learn a lot of things. I learn a lot of things with Assassin's Creed, but the purpose is not that. The purpose is entertainment. This kind of thing is uh, another thing. Okay, and using this idea, I can do uh, different scenarios. I can do a lot of things to stress and to train this this uh, kind of professional. And not only cops, 
I can do this kind of thing for firemen, cops, uh, uh, doctors, people who work on emergencies of the hospitals. And imagine any kind of situation, any kind of profession uh, with stressful situations and stressed people. Yeah. One interjection, so you, but you can actually use games like Assassin's Creed or some also retro computer games. If you modify the content, you might be able to use them yes. to uh, do these yes. situations, uh, these learning situations. So, yeah. um, actually, this is a very active line of research. There's a lot of people using uh, modified games, uh, looks like games, but they're trying to teach something to people. For example, you can use uh, a very old game like the first GTA, you know, the first GTA, that one you, you look uh, above. Of course, uh, some of you <laughs> probably don't know that, but I know because I play everything. And um, to teach kids how to drive safely, to teach kids how to understand uh, red light, yellow light, this is very silly for us, but for kids, this is very important, you know? Uh, so, uh, I need a scenario since I'm doing some sort of simulator and I have a lot of possibilities. I show those possibilities to my uh, local advisor. Uh, by the way, my main advisor in Brazil uh, didn't see this, <laughs> this whole thing yet, <laughs> but my local advisor, Professor Jeremiah, uh, he advises me to pick something more universal. Okay, uh, you don't have Let's here, <laughs> uh, in Austria, you don't have, for example, rebellions or riots. You have this kind of, no, it's not common. Uh, arrest, arrest situation, this is not very common here, I believe. Oh, sure. uh, when, when, I, when, I try, when I try to find a scenario, uh, try to imagine something like, I need a scenario uh, who works here, and in my country, <laughs> I need to, actually I need a scenario uh, that could possibly works everywhere. So uh, I think on a lot of things. These uh, are only five, but I, I as a designer, I'm a designer by the way. I'm not a computer scientist or something like this. You just game programming, so yeah, <laughs> something like this. <laughs> as a designer, uh, my job is. Uh, to have ideas. I have thousands, thousands. Mm -hmm. And this is very easy. Some of them are terrible, but some of, some of them are very good. So I decided to go with domestic violence because this thing happens on the whole world, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Uh, and if you need reasons, I give you thousands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah there is way more than this, okay? And I believe this is uh, uh, enough to justify why I chose this scenario. And all of these things are very related with Europe, but some of those things are not only here, okay? And it's impossible to say like, oh, poor countries uh, suffer, uh, women in poor countries suffer more than an in rich country. Uh, this is not very true because uh, the, the statistics show us something different, okay? And uh, yeah, this is a universal problem. This is extremely uh, stressful scenario for cops. This is not only what I'm telling you. Uh, there is uh, some scientific papers about uh, police stress, uh, police uh, officers uh, stress and one of the first things they, they relate when asked about stress is this kind of scenario. Uh, home disturbance, uh, this kind of thing. Okay. In general, police officers have, have uh, protocols to do with this kind of thing. Why this uh, thing is important? Because I need to know uh, this kind of situation have a protocol to deal with. Because in my country, the police have almost the same protocol here, I imagine. I'm not sure yet, but uh, I'm about to discover this. And that's why I came up with this idea, okay? So uh, the scenario itself uh, is comprised with a lot of steps. And right now, I 
already did the planning and right now I'm working on the simulator itself. But uh, this thing is not very easy to explain because I, uh, since I'm doing this thing alone, I do a lot of things uh, at the same time. Uh, and in the last three weeks, we've been working on the IoT part. We discovered something, some things very interesting. And at the same time, I'm, I'm developing the, the, the simulator. Um, I tried to describe the scenario because I didn't bring anything with me. Okay. But it's a, very, a, a suburban house and there are two cops inside a car, inside a car, a police car. You are one of the cops, probably uh, a cop in training. And the other cop is a very experienced guy. And this guy will help you to navigate on this situation. So um, they start talking, they are inside the car, they start talking about ah, the neighbor, the, the, the day, the, the, I don't know, something. And there is a call. Someone asks the cops to attend to a house. There is something happens. In this house and cut we go to the second scene the second scene is uh, where the action happens and this action is a little bit disturbing because the cops go to the house when you go out to the car and this is the moment uh, where the action begins so you have to decide what uh, you have to do there is a lot of possibilities uh, I designed six, seven possibilities, different possibilities. Uh, for example, you can draw your gun. The other cop can draw your, uh, the, his gun. Uh, and there is a husband. There is a wife. They are fighting. The husband will take the wife as hostage. And you have to decide what happened next. It's a very tricky situation because I'm trying to play with uh, the psychological aspects with the police cop. And he had to decide what happens. But not only that, uh, this is the part I think. So my advisor, give me uh, another idea. I need a supervisor, someone who is supervising the simulation, someone who is, of course, outside the simulation. And this guy had a phone or tablet or something to follow this, this, uh, this whole simulation. And this guy, using a tablet or a phone, can um, choose something like uh, the husband hurts the wife or the husband releases the wife or the husband hurts the wife and runs uh, towards uh, another cop and this kind of situation there's a lot of possibilities a lot of things could go wrong <laughs> on this scenario and the thing is doesn't matter what happens i will cause some stress i will probably cause some stress because of the scenario itself is very stressful there is no right or wrong, of course. The, the cop needs to follow the rules and needs to follow the, the protocol. Okay? Again, I don't know what is the protocol, but I don't care about the girl the protocol. I care about the scenario and I care about the stress because during the simulation, I will probably record the vitals. Mm -hmm. And I use this thing later to show real data. So this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to create not only a simulator, not only a IoT system. I'm trying to create a solution that uses both to deliver something. And I really hope uh, using this kind of thing, I try to, to create better cops. I try to improve. <laughs> the training of the cops, okay? That's, that's the, <laughs> the idea of my research. Uh, and um, I would probably have something more tangible to show 
uh, on the next weeks. And if you are, I don't know, interested in see something like I, re I already have the scenario, I already have the, the characters, I have a lot of things I can show. And but I, I really want to show you something using How's your lab called again up there. The game, uh, the, the on, on campus, how's the lab, lab uh, called where you work? What do you mean? Game lab or Zero Miles Lab? How is what's the Oh, name? Spy, Spy, yeah, the, the Pi Lab. Oh, yeah. Pi Lab. Uh, I work at the Pi Lab, uh, playful interactive environments, uh, and you are very welcome. To pop up there, <laughs> ask me for a demo. In a few weeks, I probably have something to show you. Uh, not only on the simulator, I hope, but uh, using the IoT system. Uh, regarding the IoT part, my main role after I walk a little bit more with the simulator is to try to bridge the gap between virtual reality and the real world. To do this kind of thing, I would probably, probably, I use a lot of things related with the, the things you learn at this class. Uh, protocol, hardware, software, MQTT. MQTT. <laughs> that's, that's the idea. MQTT, uh, Node-RED, uh, ESPs, sensors, this kind of things. And yeah. A lot of work. Yeah. So there's a surprise for you, Houston. So one of the student groups yesterday approached me because they want to use a heart rate sensor. Mm -hmm. and I don't have a reliable one, but I said we still have the issue to have a nice integration of the heart rate sensor you have yeah, into yeah. an MQTT environment. So maybe there are some synergies that you could give the students for the next two weeks the heart rate sensor. Yeah. And then they can help you kind of connecting this in a nice, easy, MQTT way. Cool, <laughs> cool super. Uh, uh, I chose uh, one uh, sensor. It's a very good one. Mm, okay, it's a it's a very nice one. The idea of sensor is a very nice one. But the problem is not only how to connect things. Uh, he is a IoT specialist. I'm a designer. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he can do a lot of things IoT related. I can do a lot of things about. Uh, design, animation, motion, 3D, modeling, this kind of thing. But we don't understand very well the data. <laughs> this is another problem. Uh, the problem I will probably try to solve later. <laughs> okay, that's the idea. Thank you very much. So, let's do the owl. You see, that's the owl. No, but... <laughs> no. So... Uh... You see a little bit of the process. It's also in the makerspace. So our goal was we wanted to make an arts piece with which you could interact without touching it. Yeah? So we wanted to have something behind glass which you could kind of uh, easily interact with with your cell phone and kind of get something triggered. So and there was this lady who made these really cute owls and then we started, yeah, sewing on the owl uh, LX, uh, yeah, LEDs. So we used conductive thread. And so the lady who helped me there was actually a, a custom designer, and she did a lot of uh, performance uh, support with skirts, with LEDs in there, and a gyroscope. And depending on how people move, the LEDs show different colors. And so we started thinking how we can do a bit more interaction and use wireless technology to make the whole thing more interesting. So I show you a little video from the owl. Uh, there. I'm going to show you the owl project, which we have finished here now. And so we actually scan a QR code. And then, oh, it's really hard to see. So then actually the, the LEDs light up and show different colors. And uh, then they switch off. When we go, can you scan again? Yes. Like, while I focus on the on the owl. Oh yeah, there you see the lights turn blue and red, and massive, and then green and yellow, and then it turns it off. Yeah, that's it. And that works wirelessly, even if we, at the moment, kind of feed power to the owl. 
But yeah, I think it's a success. <laughs> Thanks for helping, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> So, and uh, as I didn't bring the owl, um, I have just the uh, uh, demonstration with me. Does anybody of you have a barcode reader on their phone installed? Would you uh, scan that code and look at the eyes of the owl <laughs> while he's doing that? It's a link and you have to visit the link or if your scanner goes automatically to the link, it should be triggered. Yes. Both eyes. Both eyes are flashing because the if it does this, it's uh, flashing one eye once in a while just to attract attention. Mm -hmm. And then if you scan the code, it should send you to my IoT page. And uh, yeah, do that. So you can also uh, use that actually to kind of yeah get people to rate it. So kind of you can go to a specific, send them to a specific URL. And then, yeah, uh, leave some feedback or you could do where to buy, uh, this kind of things. So, but uh, you know already that there's a lot involved so that I can let you on your phone kind of scan that and then my owl here is actually uh, reacting to this. So I show you what is going on there. Let's go to Node Red and the OWL tab. <laughs> so you see, I can trigger it for testing. I can trigger the eyes myself. Uh, this should be running now. And um, but uh, what is actually happening is you see, I'm subscribed here to a topic on uh, my server. It's a, another different way to access uh, uh, my MQTT server in the net. And then I get the trigger right from there. And then I show you the OWL code. I, what's happening on my server? In my server, I have a web server which has a CGI script, and the CGI script triggers an MQTT message. And then forwards to my website. So there's actually several things that I, uh, you know, neural.net runs an MQTT server. That's the one I'm connecting to. And then uh, the CGI script I have is just sending an MQTT publish right to this topic. And this is how I connect this on this end. But the code of the owl is kind of interesting. So let's check the owl code. And this should kind of remind you a lot of what we have done yesterday. So you see again, I have something with animations. And so I have the RGB strip here, which are the eyes. And I take now the first and the fifth uh, LED on there. And again, I create an animator, which has a frame rate. And here's the frame builder, which we kind of talked about yesterday. And see, depending on the animation type, here I run different animations. And it's basically I just the way I create the new color for the eye. So usually the animation is always just making the eye black, uh, switched off. But depending on the uh, animation type, which is active, I do a different type here of animation. And you see uh, later, I just add the, uh, the colors command here uh, to trigger this. But I have another animation which is triggered randomly with the wink. So you see in the end, I do a start wink. So wink is when you kind of close your uh, eye. Uh, and then depending on some random variables, I do different transitions between different colors uh, uh, here and trigger this. And so I just set a destination color and then um, I uh, also select which eye is the one which uh, is working. And uh, you see, I use this do later thing and I even use a random timer. So it's between 60 and 90 seconds that the next wink is actually starting. So there are two things going on. There's the animation you can trigger from outside with the anim topic, and there's an internal wink uh, going on with random times. 
So that's the owl. We li really like that as a showcase to show how interaction via the network for everyone with an arts object is possible. So the owl version two, which I hope I will soon start, will flap the wings. Yeah, I want to put a little servo in the owl and make it <laughs> fly. So I have been involved in DC in some theater production. And um, first just as a basically reviewer, but so on the first performance, um, we had a Windows 10 computer driving the performance and uh, there was, you see this kind of a PowerPoint-ish thing going in the back. And Windows 10, uh, you know, I think about two, three years ago, you couldn't prevent Windows 10 from upgrading. So it was then, yeah, upgrading during the performance that was a little bit embarrass embarrassing. So, um, and that's when I decided, okay, you cannot use Windows 10 in any professional environment. So because of this forced upgrade, I think they have changed that uh, in the meantime, but it was just in the, uh, in the beginning uh, of Windows 10 where they said, okay, we upgrade. If you don't upgrade often enough, we upgrade for you. Or if there's a new update out, we just upgrade. So it, can you just imagine you're in a professional multimillion dollar presentation and Windows is just upgrading on you? So yeah, of course my solution was uh, we developed the performance pie and the performance pie basically has a pre-rendered PowerPoint presentation uh, as a video and it basically plays a video on, and allow with IoT and remote control to jump to different points in the video. And that worked super well. So basically I prepared a box which you could put upstairs into uh, the, light off, in the light box and uh, it was basically uh, connected to the projector and had a Wi-Fi uh, working on there and we connected the phone of one of the facilitators who were downstairs with it so we didn't need even anybody sitting up in the light box we could control now everything uh, interactively from uh, below on the floor so it was both both the IOT gateway and the uh, PowerPoint playing was uh, controlled from the Pi and we thought oh that's actually cool business ideas we should just let people send us PowerPoints and we sent them a Pi with an SD card back and the only thing this Pi can do is play this one PowerPoint. Yeah, I haven't done that, but uh, that worked out pretty well from that point. Yeah, so the, the uh, so it's not, you know, it, it was still called you know, IoT at that point. So now IoT and power. And um, yeah, it was really nice. So it really reduced the number of people we needed to, to do this whole performance. I think you could even go so far that you connect the DMX lighting system in the light box to the Pi and you would be able to even uh, control some of the stage lights. This was on the Fringe Festival. I don't know if you know what a Fringe Festival is, Houston. No. It's kind of like an indie arts uh, uh, presentation where basically everybody can do a performance. And uh, yeah, it's kind of low budget, low cost, uh, very few people. It's probably a little bit like what the Oka or so does here in uh, in Linz. So it's kind of the alternate, kind of an alternative art scene uh, for performance. But what I want you to take from it is that IoT can play a huge role actually in supporting any type of performance, from very little things like here, where it's just something on a small in a small theater on the stage, but up to huge installations in a stadium, uh, you could support that a lot and is already supported a lot with IoT. So take, keep that in mind as maybe as an idea, performance support is a huge area too for Internet of Things. Um, so there's another performance of one of my colleagues in uh, Brasilia. So she um, does a plasma performance. So she has actually one of these uh, Tesla coils on stage and she plays music on it with having different currents uh, on it. And there's just a huge light show. And because she has the plasma coil, she has this remote powering. So they have these, um, um, they have these neon tubes. And if you bring a neon tube near to a plasma coil, it actually lights up. And there's a lot of stuff with wireless interaction going on on stage. So she, she even wears a, 
wears um, uh, a, a mind reading headset so she can actually trigger uh, things with just thinking about it. So it's a lot about wireless things happening, a lot about light. And again, so that's a, a point where you can make very custom, very interesting solution, very integrated solutions uh, with IoT in the performance space. This is uh, so chronologically, this happened actually before. So this is um, something which is uh, monitored by an artist who is a friend of a local artist here at the Kunstuni. So all my arts contacts in Brazil are through the Kunstuni here in uh, Linz. And so this is um, it's kind of a house installation. So they put a lot of Arduinos and ESPs and Raspberry Pis into a house and monitored things like soil, temperature, uh, but they also had kind of a really ecological garden. So they all used it to be very su sustainable, very green. Uh, and, um, but combined that a lot with awareness building. So it's actually a, a house in Sobradinho. Sobradinho is one of the kind of poorer cities uh, uh, outside of Brasilia. And um, they turned, as you see, the garden in it, into a jungle and they grew all their food uh, there. But so they used the IoT not only for running the normal home automation stuff, but also for controlling all the, the animations in there. They even turned the whole year, they monitored data into music. So you could listen, you could pick your birthday and then listen to the weather turned into music uh, in the house. So they used the data collection and turned the data into arts. And they also, yeah, presented that to kids. So they also taught that in class to, uh, to teach, Ardu learn Arduino and uh, so how to collect the data in school. So they kind of combined all these things together. This was a really cool presentation. And with the same artists I met there, um, I built two arts pieces for uh, ah, yeah. and in the end, of course, that was all running based on IoT and power. Yeah? So I came there, there were lots of bugs, and I said, hey guys, let's switch out the gateway and maybe some things run a little smoother. You see here also the, uh, I think there's still water on that one. <laughs> so you see here um, kind of the same thing I just had yesterday on the table with the long LED strips. Um, they had actually a tree in that garden uh, where these LED strips were hanging on there and we connected to the tree uh, a galvanic sensor, basically a lie detector. We connected a lie detector to the tree and we measured conductivity and direction of the tree and then turned that into color. So you could breathe on leaves of the tree and you would see something happening in reaction to your breath onto the plant uh, in these LED strips which had an animation going on. So uh, two more things controlled by one IoT and power gateway. So that one thing is uh, the lie still hammock. So in the hammock, you see it's really hard. Uh, the lighting is pretty bad. There's a projector next to it. So if you lie down and be very still, you get a nice uh, relaxing presentation uh, on top of you. If you move too much, the presentation stops. So you have to be very quiet again and then the animation starts. So it's a little bit kind of making you relax. And then there's a, there's a very funny piece. It's called the hair piece. It has something to do with kind of being remotely in contact with plants. So there has been a sacrifice of one person to a plant which was dying of the hair to protect the plant from the elements and the plant came back. And so this was the inspiration of building this disconnected art piece. So that's a uh, that's a small cutling of the plant and we installed a sensor in there. So if you look at the plant, the hair piece moves. So it's kind of really weird effect. So people kind of look at the plant and then they hear, the, then they hear some kind of weird noise behind them and they see this hair uh, going on. It's, yeah, it's, uh, you have to see that actually live to kind of feel that kind of connectedness, disconnectedness uh, of these two arts pieces making one arts piece together. But you can imagine, again see how the wireless elements uh, play into this and enable such type 
of art. So, um, same artists again. Uh, so the um, two professors I'm working with are in uh, the, the Public University of Rio de Janeiro with Malu Fra Fragoso and Guto Nobrega. And yeah, we're doing something with beads and building awareness for beads. They made a little movie with this and you might recognize some things in this movie. Uh, Yeah, yeah, bees are, isn't that the same problem in Austria too, that yeah. bees are kind of in danger? We can do the same thing here. <laughs> yes, this team, I have you seen it now. Bees are much more aggressive in Brazil than they are here. It's a different type of bees. know this guy. He's talking about FARP and <laughs> edge computing there. <laughs> and this we have done yesterday. <laughs> and there's the leap motion. And now the artist's understanding of what I <laughs> taught them. Outside of Rio de Janeiro is the farm about two hours west from Rio, uh, where this is done. This is the artist, Malu. And we'll see the installation of our first prototype. Somebody measuring Wi-Fi strengths. <laughs> There's our electronics going into the <laughs> beehive. There's a little bit on the other side where you can experience what we record with the bees. Ah. And so what are we doing? So again, in the beehive recording temperature, weight, you've seen, so kind of playing with the scale. Uh, so we're trying to monitor the honey production and, and so on. We're also measuring, the, uh, so we have a microphone in there. So we just uh, record the sound. We have two cameras, we have an infrared camera inside the beehive connected to a Pi Zero 
and uh, uh, a normal daylight camera outside to track how many bees are going in and how the activity is. Also the infrared camera to kind of see temperature distribution uh, inside uh, the hive. And um, then they had the big issue, yeah, how to kind of connect the presentation site in uh, Rio de Janeiro with the farm. Uh, so we have kind of a low, we have two local gateways. We have, uh, we set up the MQTT server in the cloud for them and then the connectivity and also explain them how to tunnel with SSH uh, into the farm and then get live access to the videos and how to kind of store videos and then kind of play the videos later. So uh, there was a lot kind of to explain with this kind of fog, <laughs> uh, edge and cloud computing idea for them to understand that. And so we are probably next year, uh, beginning of next year, we will do the hyper organics, which is basically bringing together artists from all over the world who consume and produce data. And so we want to be the big orchestrator. So we want to have a big node red and MQTT installation on site and uh, help the artists to feed information in there and the persons who do sound and uh, visualize the stuff to consume the information from there and then switch the data streams live all the time. So we want to kind of meet up and kind of do weird things in combination from data which comes from there and visualize it in interesting uh, or make it uh, audible in, d in interesting ways. So I'm pretty excited to be the orchestra. It's like the data DJ using Node-RED uh, kind of moving uh, things between art pieces uh, there. So I think that will be very exciting to do and kind of a, a, a nice, again, uh, uh, instantiation of using I Internet of Things and the connectivity aspect uh, for the arts. LEDs, yeah, so you have yesterday seen me using 150. Uh, you have used seven yourself and probably will continue with it today. So I won with a student in uh, Washington DC uh, at, the, in, at the George Mason University an arts competition. See, the arts pays me better at the moment than <laughs> the computer scientists do. So we built a mural. So we won a mural uh, competition. A mural is kind of yeah, Bandmalerei uh, to, um, uh, and so we installed 4,000 LEDs uh, on something like the door entrance door here, like the, uh, uh, yeah, kind of half of the window. And um, yeah, I had to do a lot with power connectivity and we were thinking about ways to interact with it. And it was all under the topic of digital identity. And I think that might be the last movie. Let me think what I planned else. Yeah, let's quickly kind of, um, there's one more installation I built. This is the artificial window uh, for actually inspired by the situation with my wife. So in the US, a lot of people ha don't have daylight in their offices. In the US, there are not very many worker rights. And so lots of people don't get an office with a window. And um, so my wife is one of them. And so I built a window to produce kind of the illusion of daylight. And uh, then I thought, okay, that's boring to just have something which switches on white light and you can switch off. And I thought, I'm an IoT guy, I can do more. So uh, this window can, as you see, also kind of simulate some kind of meadow situation with blue sky and green grass be below. But it was close to Halloween when I built the first version of it. And it also has a Halloween mode, so it can do thunder and blood running down the window and it has uh, speakers so it can have screams and uh, real thunder. But also when you have the nature simulations, you can use the speakers to play a little creek or birds and uh, you can do a fireplace simulation. So that looks really nice. So it kind of makes the, her room much more cozy. Yeah, and it's kind of a big attraction now at the embassy <laughs> to see actually this uh, window in space. And actually, you, this is one of the things where you wonder, is this really IoT? Because I'm not allowed to connect it to the internet. You can imagine it would be really cool because you could show the live weather 
<laughs> on the window if I had internet connectivity, but in the embassy compound, I'm not allowed to have any wireless connectivity. So it's running a Pi 2 because the Pi 2 doesn't have any Wi-Fi built in. So, but very quickly about the digital identity or quickly about the lab. We're continuing project two today and you finish the new sense of actors task from last time. So let's finish with the digital identity movie about the installation in DC. This doesn't have any sound, so I can actually make it a little faster. Uh, speed, faster. So Reed is my student. And so this art, yeah, was about uh, reflecting on the selfie culture. And there you see, uh, it's really hard to capture because the LEDs are so bright, so they actually consume a thousand watts if they are all white. And uh, um, even if it's very pixely, but it's kind of really overwhelming when you are just right in front of it. So when we connected it to Twitter, so we were able to see live streams of Twitter uh, on there. We extracted the images out of the Twitter feed. Uh, but you could also send your own, so we had a special channel we were monitoring, you could tweet your own image and then you could see your own image uh, on there. And then we were working on different effects to destroy images or destroy your own selfie. We wanted to use a heart rate sensor to basically measure the beat and then kind of destroy with at each heartbeat your image even more, but yeah, we didn't get that far. But it was still very very impressive and uh, looked pretty nice. It was a lot of work to set this thing up. Yeah. yeah and it was on several uh, exhibitions. And it's still it's still in the installed in the makerspace, so and at night you kind of can see <laughs> the picture stream going there. You see it's not very perfect, but uh, yeah. But the pixelation actually has a very interesting effect because it kind of distorts the reality a little bit and the stuff with having so many images of people and yourself is qu quite questionable. So I think it, it's a pretty valid arts piece and kind of triggers a lot of reflection if you look at that. Yeah, I, I, I hope you liked it. If you need more ideas, go to the Ars Electronica Center. There are some things uh, there. This is one piece here, maybe, uh, uh, one of my favorites with the atomic bits. We could actually build that ourselves. This is with bottles which play music when you kind of put the uh, lid out of there, just as a, another source of inspiration. But this is not my stuff, so I showed you actually all the project where I was involved. So I hope you like that, got some new ideas, and uh, I'm curious about uh, your scenarios today. Thanks.